Sure. Yes. I'll be recording. And let's go ahead and speak. Just say what. One, two, three, four. Speak a little louder. One, two, three, four. Okay. Perfect. Is it better, right? If yes. Speak louder. Yeah, okay. Speak. Uh, speak one more time. Uh, um. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So this will be solidarity interview. Mm -hmm. So professional. Oh, yeah. So first, I would just like to have a brief history of Poland between 1945 and 1970. Just general things, sort of what you were going through with the tour guide. Just, just a, maybe a couple. Of, Maybe a minute or two of just okay okay so um history of poland during that time post-war period wow that's an interesting <laughs> approach okay <laughs> okay so um when you refer to 1945 it's natural and it's actually what we do on our uh at our permanent exhibition we refer to winston churchill and his speech in fulton when he said that the iron curtain had cut the Europe in half and that's actually what happened. So Poland was one of the countries with um, Hungary, Czechoslovakia at the time, um, Lithuania, Latvia, um, Estonia and etc etc that uh, became a part of the of the Soviet sphere of influence and that's a really na that's an euphemism actually to say because the Soviet sphere of influence meant that those countries were deprived of human rights, were deprived of civil rights, were deprived of uh, economical help that was uh, given to Europe after the, um, after the war, so were excluded from the Marshall Plan. It meant that, for, well, for Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, that was actually the end of their independence because they became the part of the of the Soviet Union. And for Poland, it meant that the uh, the government that was fully um, that was fully um, responding to to the authorities of Soviet Union was established instead of the democratic and independent government of the country. And that was actually the beginning of uh, of the, the history uh, in Poland, and of course that was the the result of uh, Yalta and uh, and Potsdam agreements, when uh, the three uh, the three main parties that decided to establish that established the post-war uh, order. So that was uh, President Roosevelt. Uh, well, in Potsdam it was actually President Truman. Um, uh, Joseph Stalin and uh, Winston Churchill um, decided how to actually, you know, divide Europe among between those who actually won the war. And unfortunately, Poland, uh, despite being the only country during the Second World War that established the underground, uh, um, uh, the underground country and the underground army and the underground education etc etc also fall under under the uh, the dominancy of the Soviet Union and for up to 1989 it meant that there was no free election in Poland that there was censorship that there was um, uh, that there was a constant struggle for civil uh, rights and human rights here in the country and it's changed and the beginning of the changes happened here in Gdańsk shipyard where we are right now uh in this genuine place uh <laughs> where the strike in august 1980 started and where the independent from the communist party trade unions were actually agreed upon so between the authorities communist authorities and the interfactor striking communist a committee, so the authorities of the uh, of the strike. So that's a really short lesson of yes. that. Uh, during that time, you have, of course, the the protests that happened uh, that happened across the um, Central and Eastern Europe, because that's the reference that we usually use here in uh, uh, in Poland and in this part of Europe. Uh, so, of course, you have the the protests in 1953 in. Uh, 
um, East Germany, then in 1956 you have protests here in Poland, but also you have an uprising in Hungary. In um, 1968 you have uh, Prague Spring, so the invasion of the, uh, of the Warsaw Treaty Army on Czechoslovakia because of their um, approach to have some democratic changes. And in 1968 you have also the uh, protest here in Poland uh, that started with a student's protest against the censorship, but then it of course spread it more, uh, it spread it widely. And then in 1970 you have something that will create the identity of this region. So we have protests on the Polish Baltic coast, the workers' protests uh, against the communist uh, authorities. That ended bloody in, uh, uh, and at least 45 people were killed at that time here. Yeah, so, yeah, and that leads you. Then you have, of course, another protest in 1976 uh, in uh, the central Poland. And then it leads you to 1980 and the protest that started here in Gdańsk shipyard. Oh, a question: Just uh, what were the catalysts and of the 19, December 1970? Oh, you can talk about the things that supercharged that moment, the, the, the events that led up to that um, December 1970, and if there's any stories. Uh, that may not be known to the Western world about what happened in 1970. Well, I don't think that 1970 is a. It's actually a date that is well known in the Western world. It's just you know it's a part of uh, of Polish history and it's also of course a part of uh, of the European history. But the communist authorities actually did everything in their power to just you know quiet it down. Uh, during during the, the communist time. But if you want to approach this story, I think it, the good start is the monument that we have outside of this building. It's the monument to the fallen shipyard workers with three crosses just, you know, standing up to the sky uh, in front of the ECS building right now. And they are established on the... Well, the, 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 the monument is situated on the Solidarity Square. And well, December 1970. Well, the spark that started the, the protest were uh, rising in prices of the basic goods in uh, in Poland, and that was the spark that started the protest on the 14th of December 1970. But uh, the fuel, well, it was fueled by all the protests that happened before, and it was fueled by the situation that were in Poland at that time. So. Um, inflation, uh, deprivation of uh, um, of human rights, deprivation of civil rights, the uh, weak economy, the lack of basic goods in Polish shops, the lack of um, basic rights in uh, in Polish society, and that's actually you know if you combine all those uh, all those um, elements together, that was what uh, what really happened in. Uh, December 1970, and then on the 14th of uh, of December, the uh, the first protesters here from Gdańsk Klenin shipyard uh, went into the street in protest against uh, uh, the rising of prices, but actually in protest uh, against the condition that that Poland was actually in. And then, of course, those protests spread all across the Baltic coast. So you had protests in Gdynia, the city that we have nearby. And that was one of the most uh, violent ones, because, uh, uh, and also the most tragic ones, because the day before, the Black Thursday, how we, how actually those events are called in Gdynia. So the day before, on the 16th of December, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Poland called the workers to come back to the shipyards, and he he just asked them to go back to work, and that the situation will be. Uh, will be resolved and that they will be heard, and that's what they did. But once they once they decided to come to the shipyard, they actually uh, were greeted by the fire, the fire that and and of course the the violence uh, by the uh, communist police and army, and uh, those were the most tragic events during those times. So actually. That was lesson uh, that was learned by the Polish society that uh, the communist authorities will not hesitate to use uh, violence and to kill 
the representatives of their own society um, just to protect the, uh, the system. Okay, the next question will be about the uh, uh, explaining the role of the committee KLR. Um, don't know what the is that yes. the acronym. Okay, yeah. just the, it, working to help uh, for to their their aid in imprisoned workers. We want to speak about a, just a broad overview of their role in. Yeah. Solidarity. Sorry that you haven't asked me these questions at the, you know, at That's the... I wrote them down. <laughs> okay. I and the, you can use, of course, the, you know, the footage from the exhibition at the time. Right. I'm, I'm not editing your movie, I'm just not <laughs> saying like that. But, okay, should I speak to you or should I speak to the camera? Because I, I'm doesn't naturally, matter. you know, just it just speaking to you. It doesn't matter, whatever, what do you like? Okay. Maybe you will take the chair over there because we are... Yeah, that will be more useful. Yes. Yeah, you really have to be taken care of, don't you? Yourself, yes. <laughs> yes, it's just... Okay, better. Yeah. It will be much more comfortable. Yes, Definitely. I agree. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the Workers' Defence Committee, because that's what you are really asking me for, so the one that we are referring to on the, uh, in room B, the power of the powerless, uh, of, our, um, of our exhibition. Um, actually, it's 1976, and in June 1976, you have another wave of protest, this time in central Poland, in Płock, Gradom and Ursus. And uh, the result of those, of those uh, protests is that many workers are expelled from or fired from work or sacked from work, are arrested and the political trials are also taking taking place there because those are the trials they are actually uh being interrogated because they had they participated in the protest and uh, that was the moment when polish intellectuals also those who were involved in uh, in the events of uh, 1968 created the committee that's uh, main goal uh which that has its main goal in protecting those who are uh, oppressed by the communist sector, to those workers who are oppressed by the communities. So they provide help. Um, that's the beginning, of course, of this cooperation. They provide help to families that um, uh, that are um, actually touched by or that are not influenced, but actually that, that lost the fathers or, you know, uh, that, that father, that, that the head of the families that were arrested or, you know, taken into prison. So the committee provides help to those families, but the committee also provides help, uh, legal help for those who are um, the subject of those political trials. And that's the beginning of the cooperation with the uh, with the workers, and uh, that's also the beginning of uh, many other organizations that will be established in Poland after 1976, and there will be organizations from different uh, ideological backgrounds and different political backgrounds. But they are rooted in, uh, but they are rooted in in the changes that are happening in the second um, half of the of the 70s here in Poland beginning with the with Poland being um uh with Poland being a part of the Helsinki uh, final art the uh, final act I'm sorry uh so being also uh represented so Poland being also um represented in international law, law protecting such uh, organizations that are taking care of the of the human rights and also the changes that happened in during the second half of the 70s here in Poland not to mention that uh, there is also another uh, another um, element that uh, that is helping Polish society to to build new identity and this new approach, which is uh, appointing uh, Cardinal Karol Wojtyła in October 1978 as a head of the Catholic Church. So as um, uh, the Cardinal from Krakow became the new Pope, the first Pope in centuries that is not 
uh, from the Italian origin, but is actually here from, from Central and Eastern Europe, was also the new uh, um, the new element that strengthened the the opposition here here in Poland. And in political terms, it meant that we had the head of state that knows exactly what is happening here in, in Central and Eastern Europe, but knows exactly how Moscow can behave and uh, and is behaving, actually, and, and the approach that it has towards the, the countries that are uh, under the sphere of influence. It's also the time of, of course, uh, President Carter in uh, in US, with Zbigniew Brzezinski being one of his advisors. There is also um, a representative uh, uh, not a representative, but a person who is also focusing on Central and Eastern Europe in an American government, and it's also something that has to be added here. And the help from labor unions in the United States, can you just uh, speak to other organizations around the world that had sent money and funding to the committee to help? Uh, was it solely the United States and the American auto workers and AFL-CIO or other nations were sent? Well, out? we can speak about um, this huge wave of help uh, if we are referring to the Marshall Law, because that's actually 1981. And when the Marshall Law was introduced, that was this huge wave of solidarity from, you know, on global scale. And that was the moment when actually, you know, this, uh, mm, this help is... Uh, I think it's the the um, uh, becomes so essential for for the for the newborn solidarity. So you you are speaking about the moment when solidarity was already established in the new uh, social movement, or trade union, if you would like to also refer uh, refer to uh, to the original name, um, is created. And you know, introduction of the martial law is actually the moment when. The communist uh, authorities in Poland, and also, of course, the authorities of the Soviet Union, wants to stop the revolution that has already started, and that's the moment when you have this huge help, a huge wave of help. Yes, of course, from the United States, but also from, of course, all over Europe. From uh, because also in uh, Western Europe, the organizations and committees that have uh, that. Um, which has uh, help of to solidarity as its main goal, or the, what, that are created to, for, um, only to you know that are created only to help solidarity and to help Polish people during the martial law are created, and there are already the committees that are established in the United Kingdom or in France. But this help is not only the help in uh, terms of you know trade union to trade union this is of course the those committees and organizations were actually established by the activities you know all around the globe and that was of course the material help but that was also the intellectual you know, support those were the debates that were made you know around the situation in Poland those were the involvement of the intellectuals to spread the knowledge of what is really happening in Poland at that time. Those were journalists that came to Poland to uh, or informed the, the societies in their countries about the situation that is happening in Poland right now. Those were politicians, for example, who came uh, to Poland but also made such symbolic gestures as, uh, for example, meeting with Lech Wałęsa or visiting the uh, or visiting the grave of um, of uh, Jerzy Popiełuszko, who was a solidarity chaplain, uh, solidarity priest, uh, murdered by the communist secret service uh, in 1984. So there were many different um, approaches toward this help that Poland actually received, and is really thankful for it this time. Uh, here at the ECS, we have uh, we have a project that is called Medal of Gratitude, and we are awarding. Uh, those uh, friends of solidarity and those friends of Poland who helped during the communist times, but who are also right now uh, trying to make this um, European democracy 
uh, stronger and responsible, you know, for for the whole for the whole continent. Uh, we'd like to talk now about the the lead up uh, to the actual uh, main strike that began the movement in 1980, the firing of Anna Valentinovich. Mm -hmm. Please speak a few words about what the events have transpired there. Yeah, you and should like, definitely I'm, ask I'm, me that at the exhibition. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> okay, I'll just... Um, my uh, ball tea, <laughs> not to lose my voice. Um, okay. Um, uh, so I've told you about the, let's say, social and political environment of the second half of the 70s. And here in the um, in the Baltic coast and here in Gdańsk, we also had an organization which was uh, that was called the Free Trade Unions of the uh, of the Baltic coast. I would, I would call that uh, that way. And the members of those organizations were. Uh, Bogdan Borusevich, Alina Pinkowska, um, Andrzej Gwiazda, Joanna Duda Gwiazda, Anna Valentinowicz, uh, um, Krzysztof Wyszkowski, and etc. etc. So people who will become uh, crucial, um, crucial um, and I have a blackout. So people who have, who will become um, um, crucial persons to be responsible for the strike, for actually organizing the strike and then for, you know, strike to become what, what it really, what it really mm, was. So this really mature and uh, really um, uh, wise uh, dialogue with, uh, with authorities on its own terms, on its own uh, on its own, um, yeah, I would say on its own terms, basically. And um, actually, again, the spark that started the strike in August 1980 was actually um, sacking Anna Valentinovich from work. She was a few months before her retirement. She was uh, well known among the workers, of course, here in the Gdańsk shipyard. He was a member of the Free Trade Unions, and that was, the, of course, the initial cause of her being fired and uh, the moment when the information spread it that she's uh, she's actually fired from work was the moment when the organizers of the strike said okay we will begin the strike in solidarity with her and one of our demands will be getting her back to work and then within those first days this strike spread it into something more and on the 16th of August, uh, there was an information, uh, there was a decision made by the authorities of the strike, with Lev Wałęsa being the leader of uh, uh, of the um, of the striking committee. There was uh, the decision that we will have the solidarity strike together with all those companies that decided to join in the strike that started here in Glasgow Shipyard on the 14th of uh, August. And uh, then, well, the history is made. On the 17th of August, the 21 demands are written. And uh, then there are written down on this, um, on this uh, wooden plates that you can see in, at our exhibition. And the first demand is to establish the free independent from the, uh, the free independent from the Communist Party uh, trade unions. And that's how the history is made. Okay, uh, let me see. Nine minutes. Uh, after nine minutes, I have to change the memory. Yeah, but you know, I just. Do you, how much time do you have? Well, we are actually exceed time, so you know. Okay. Well, how many questions do you have? have? Of uh, about fourteen, but we don't have to go through all of them. I just. Okay, want... I will have you know two minutes answers, and then I will just okay. you know. Is it something that is? Well, the, what what will be, the. Uh, talking about uh, martial law, uh, whether uh, the claim that uh, Yevlet 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 
Yes. My pronunciations. Oh, come so on, don't worry about it. Okay, perfect. I'm speaking English, you know, for, <laughs> oh, you know, sorry. all the time, and uh, I'm pretty aware of the accents that I may have. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Uh, but he had claimed that he instituted martial law as a way of preventing Soviet mm -hmm. invasion. And he said he, he claims that he did it in the best interest of the country. Do you, do you believe that to be genuine and true, or do you think that he had wanted to do it all along? Well, I think it's not a question of beliefs, but it's a question of research that we can make on that right. subject. But yes, that's true that General Jaluzewski claimed that he did it to protect the country, actually, because that's that's how we usually presented this decision. But the truth was that uh, the decision made by the Soviets was that you have to deal with solidarity on your own because the invasion in 1981 was actually something uh, that the Soviets decided not to do. They were already engaged in Afghanistan and they knew also the really strong response that they gained, uh, that they, they had uh, in um, autumn of uh, 1980, showed them that uh, there will be a global conflict if they actually decide to uh, to have this um, this invasion in, uh, in Poland, and um, also the research made uh, among others by Professor Antoni Dudek, who was also who was also one of the well-known Polish scientists focusing on the latest history of Poland, um, established that uh, no. The reason for actually for establishing the martial law was to protect the system and to protect the authorities, the Polish authorities of the communist regime. So, no, that was that's simply no, not true. Uh, during martial law, just if you can give a brief explanation of what things may have been like for the average person, what's what freedoms they may have had prior now taken away or is it sort of similar as it always no did? it wasn't okay <laughs> it wasn't similar but uh, um so when the martial law was uh, established and even then when it was actually officially ended you have um imagine the 16 month of solidarity operating legally so it was between august 1980 and uh, december 1981 so, of course, it doesn't mean that it was a, because sometimes it's called carnival, and it was not a carnival because, of course, the communists, the authorities also wanted to, you know, um, stop the, the movement. But that was the moment when 10 million people decided to join Solidarity. So half of an adult population of Poland was actually the members of, of Solidarity. That was the moment when new organizations were created. That was, of course, the moment when Solidarity as a trade union was established and it operated independently from the communists. Uh, that was the moment when democratic elections during the first National Congress of the Solidarność Delegate was here in Gdańsk again in, uh, in autumn 1981. And uh, that was the moment when uh, Lech Wałęsa was uh, actually um, chosen in a democratic elections as a chairman of the Solidarity, Solidarność. And uh, those were also those were also the times where independent, of course, still under the censorship, but uh, the censorship, but independent. Uh, um, newspapers and uh, weeklies and magazines were actually uh, printed and well, were prepared and printed. That was a time of uh, festi independent festivals, music festivals, cultural festivals. That was a moment when um, uh, Andrzej Wajda received Pan Dior for uh, for his uh, for his uh, feature Men of Iron, depicting the events here in August 1980, the events that happened here in August 1980, and also the previous events that led to them. And, uh, well, um, and ending with a question, what will happen next? That was a moment when uh, Czesław Miłosz received the uh, Nobel Prize in Literature. 
being in exile in Berkeley, you know, not being able to actually being published here in Poland. So imagine those 16 months and then you have a, an announcement in TV on a really um, mm, frosty winter day on the 13th of December when General Jaruzelski announced that he is establishing a martial law that there are new authorities in Poland, the military authorities, uh, that uh, when people learn that there is no communication because they pick up the phones and there is no signal, when there is no normal program in TV, but there is still this announcement going on and on again and again, when there is curfew on the streets, when during the first day nearly 10,000 people, solidarity activists, are arrested and taken into intern, when in Poland 52 internment camps are established. So that's the reality of martial law. And then the, the legalization of the solidarity came, and then of course you have a curfew, and then, of course, you cannot leave the voivodeship that you, the region that you live in, freely because you are, you are actually checked by the, by the army and by the, by the officials at the border of the of the voivodeship. When you have to, if you are a journalist, uh, you will have a. Yeah, you will have a conversation with your boss and the representative of Secret Service and the representative of the Communist uh, Party asking you questions, what is your attitude towards solidarity and what do you think about the introduction of the martial law and what do you think about the situation in Poland and what is your attitude towards the, uh, the Communist authorities. And that's the reality of martial law. I do not remember the reality, you know, Personally, right. uh, but uh, of course I remember uh, the reality from the perspective of my home, where actually my parents uh, were involved in the, in the opposition. I remember my father cooperating with the underground journalists and just you know smuggling the um, smuggling is it the right word? Yes. Okay. The um, uh, the underground, you know, um, papers and the b books that uh, had to be published abroad in Paris or, you know, in, in Brussels, because that's where actually the, the publishing houses uh, were established uh, by the Polish, uh, by the Polish opposition members that managed to escape to other countries. And I remember my mom being sacked from work because she decided to, um, to support uh, her uh, her team and her department, the members of her department, uh, because they wanted to um, commemorate the anniversary, the first anniversary of establishing the martial law in uh, in her in her um, um, company. She was sucked from work after that because she simply said, "Okay, you can do it," and then. She supported them. She said that was my decision. They are. Uh, okay. no. And a second approach. Second. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, solidarity interview, take two. You like that sound, don't you? It's kind of a. Uh, just, it's, make you ready. Yes, it, yeah. it's professional. Makes you ready. Make you ready. Um, okay, moving on to um, towards 1986, as uh, interned people, would you use the term in, interned or imprisoned? Uh, internment. Intern. Okay. Yeah, because that that's that was really what it was called about. What it was called. It's just they were not in prison. They were actually in a special camp. That was that camps that were created especially for that purpose. Okay. Uh, and around 1986, they start to release more. Yeah. People. There is a total amnesty. Yes. Total amnesty. Uh, can you speak to the reasons why uh, why the uh, government decides at this point in time that they need to make changes to freeing prison or freeing the interned. 
the way that we are trying to explain that uh, our exhibition um, actually is also trying to show the, the many layers that are you know in that story so first of all if you look at it globally you have of course the um, the change in an international situation so first First of all, you have uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and he's introducing perestroika, of course, to protect and to, you know, to um, re-establish the communist system. But uh, it means also that he's just, you know, losing a bit the the um, uh, the, the situation that is that is actually in the, in the states that are under the under the Soviet, uh, Soviet sphere of influence. Uh, secondly, the second term for uh, Ronald Reagan and his approach towards Soviet Union and, you know, and his support towards those democratic, um, uh, democratic organizations and, you know, democratic movements that are happening in the communist countries. So, uh, but also, of course, this, this, you know, this focus on also ending uh, the USSR economically because it's obvious at that time that so that this economy won't last. And the same situation in Poland, because the second half of the 80s is actually a kind of, a, um, I would say, it's not gray sphere, but it's a, it's, I'm always calling it that gray, gray times. Uh, Bogdan Borusevich, one of the of the leaders of Solidarity, said that uh, when in 19, because he was actually, he, he remained in hidden for five years. And he was caught uh, in 1986, and after a few months he was released, and he was released just like that. And he said that he thought, uh, if they are letting us go, just in a way that they are doing that, just without nothing, and it's just just like go. Uh, it means that they are losing, because they don't know what to do with us. And um, but on the you know if if you look at um, if you look at the situation in Poland in the second half of the 80s, uh, you have a really, you know, you have really weak economy. It's obvious even for uh, for the communists that actually the the reforms had to be, has to, had to be um, introduced because the, the economy, you know, the the the, the, um, the end of the 80s is 800 percent inflation in Poland. Uh, there is a huge immigration wave because people are leaving home, Poland because there are no perspectives here. The solidarity, uh, Solidarność, is weaker because you know it's been uh, it's been eight years since you know that the movement was born. Uh, many of the uh, of the leaders of the movement were imprisoned for many years. Of course, you have this um, you have those. You have these events that are actually bringing back this, you know, the spirit of unity, and uh, there are different ones. One of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest um, gathering of those who are opposing the the communist re regime is, for example, 1984 and the funeral of Fyodor Popiushko, the priest that I told you about, that was murdered by the secret service. But there are also gathering in 1987. Uh, because there is a third pilgrimage of John Paul II to Poland. And again, it's uh, self-organized by the people and by the church communities and those who wanted to support that. It's the moment when people again can count themselves and say, oh, there are millions of us, and the communists cannot do anything about it. Um, there are, but there are, of course, the strikes of 1988, for example, here in Gdańsk shipyard, that are completely unsuccessful. Why was that? Because there was no, you know, the, the, first of all, the solidarity was weaker. Secondly, there was also no intention to have any, you know, kind of uh, uh, agreement be between striking committees and the, the authorities. But then there is this, you know, an, there is this ongoing thought that the reforms had to be has to be introduced, and that we also have to share responsibility. And that was the moment when the communists decided, okay, we can invite solidarity to, uh, to the dialogue. And on solidarity side, there is still this ongoing approach since the martial laws introduced that we remain a peaceful movement. So the only solution is dialogue.
And of course, there is a discussion because uh, the invitation and of course the invitation and the talks that are made between those both sides are made with um, with the help of the Catholic Church in Poland, which also also the guarantee of safety for the solidarity leaders to be a part of those uh, of those uh, negotiations. And there is a discussion among solidarity. Should should we really, you know, sit? Uh, behind the same table with those people who imprisoned us and who killed our friends and who are responsible for the death of those of, in, of those who were killed in December 1970 and who were killed during the martial law and who are responsible you know, for all those really um, who are responsible for those crimes actually but the decision is yes we, we, we have to do that uh, and Speaking about the transition from one system to another, coming yeah. to capitalism and the changes that happened in Poland yeah. during that time, if you want to just, just uh, give an overview of how how that looked, how that how that was received, and how it moved forward to where Poland is today. Um. That's something that I should that I should pretty elaborate on for you know many 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 minutes, but just um, if you would ask me was uh, transformation successful, I will tell you yes, yes it was, and it's quite obvious because we are sitting right here uh, in um, in the at the European Solidarity Center. Poland is a member of the European Union. Poland is a member of NATO. Uh, Poland is right now the country that feels responsible, generally responsible, for those who uh, are still uh, on their way to the European community. Well, they are a part of European community, but they are on their way to the official structures of the European Union and NATO, so I mean Ukraine, and Belarus, etc., etc., for those who are in need, because the democracy and in case of Ukraine, uh, not only the democracy, but also their their life are threatened due to, the, of course, the Russian invasion, invasion in Ukraine. So this transformation was successful. It was also successful because Poland actually um, established democratic rules and is lead by those rules up, up to this time. Uh, were the cost of transformation? Yes, of course. The challenge that we have is that we usually um, discuss the economic transformation of Poland from, you know, our position right now when we are, uh, you know, 34 um, years after the election, the June elections of 1989, and we are also wiser and we have this knowledge that we gained through those decades. But at that time, we learned from mistakes. And unfortunately, yes, the mistakes were made. There was, of course, this um, lack of uh, social support for those who could not, um, who could not uh, transfer from one system to another on their own. There was, of course, there is right now, of course, there is still a need of uh, social reforms. Uh, we do have, of course, problem with uh, populism, like the rest of Europe and like US does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's something that is in common. And if you look at the origins of this populism, you know, the foundation of this, it's actually, you know, the, this ongoing, uh, this ongoing approach that you can do everything on your own and it's all up to you and sometimes you can be in this social group that cannot do it on its own not because you are uh, because it's it is not up to your personal um attitude or you know or even your your personal uh, possibilities but it's a structural problem so we had such, you know, problems in uh, in Poland with farmers, 
who are actually left on their own because they lived for many, many years in a, a centrally governed so-called PGRs. So, you know, the, um, those, um, those specifically created, uh, specifically created uh, kind of uh, organizational forms in in Polish uh, in Polish um, country, and uh, there were of course the workers who were sucked from work due to the reforms that were introduced. There is of course the history of Gdańsk shipyard, which is unfortunately not a uh, not a successful story of transformation, which is ironic in a way, of course. But uh, on the other hand, if you look, at, and, and, and it's also ironic because generally the Polish uh, shipyard industry and the maritime industry is doing quite well. But unfortunately, the Gdańsk shipyard is this, you know, this 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 place where the Sidar Depot was born was not uh, successful. But the reason for that also lays within uh, the decision that was made in 1988 by the communist uh, uh, by the communist authorities to uh, close the shipyard. Okay. Recording. I have to do my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Solidarity interview, take three. Okay. Okay. Sit down. Don't mind me, camera. Just gonna come over here. Okay, so if you just would like to speak to what solidarity means today in current uh, political, social context, um, and I guess I'll just start with that. Okay. Um, well, of course, it's it depends how you define solidarity. But uh, you know, for me, solidarity is actually the foundation of the of the European order, and uh, it is not a um, it is not a coincidence that this place where we are right now was um, awarded with the European Heritage Label, which is actually the award given by the European Union for those places who are um, significant for creating the. Uh, the European um, uh, community and the European, you know, it represents the European values that that we have. And um, I do think about solidarity when I see how people in Poland reacted towards uh, the war in Ukraine. If you see, if you can see this uh, this approach, you know that. Ordinary people just decided, you know, to jump into their cars and drive to the border and help those people, and people that, and you know, the, the collection of uh, of the materials, the cooperation between self-government and uh, well, the local governments and uh, and um, the citizens who decided, you know, to just create the the best condition that you have and help. In any way they could, refugees from Ukraine. But I also think of solidarity when you, when I see those people who approach our Belarus Belarusian border and try to help those who are, well, used and trapped by um, by Lukashenko and used as a actually as a tool and a really brutal and uh, and violent fight against against the the European Union and I feel sorry that we do not have the same approach towards those refugees but I do believe that uh, we'll find solidarity in that I think about solidarity when I see the officials uh, that are crossing the threshold of this facility and you know the European Solidarity Center, and they see uh, the um, the exhibition that we have that is focused on the opposition leaders on Belarus, and then they see this this building and they see this institution and they see that we are dealing with solidarity not only in historical terms but also as an inspiration 
and you know and fewer for our everyday activities and they are saying yeah we, we have to create a similar centers in our countries which is happening right now in germany for example and we have a visitor visit of um, of the german minister responsible for creating such a center in uh, in his country and he said yes this visit reminded me that we still have uh, the belarusian oppositionists that are held uh, in prisons and that we are still responsible for Ukraine and that we can find uh, the future partners in Ukraine because we do think about solidarity. That's what I think is solidarity in action. I felt solidarity in action actually when I, um, and that was really something when I saw President Biden coming to uh, Kiev on the 20th of February this year as a sign of support. So that is actually, I think that solidarity is something that uh, that must create the order of the world that we live today in turn, in political terms, in social terms, and you know, in every other terms. Because without solidarity, we are nowhere. Because we do not think about the other human being. Thank you. That was a very good answer. Um, okay.